Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. Today's case is a solved one that has so many different turns that it is so very frustrating. It's one of those cases that I am very happy to see solved, but it took way too long for it to happen and the things that were allowed to happen are truly just so frustrating and ridiculous and you'll see why in just a minute. With that being said, today we are going to be discussing the murder of Amanda Plass. Amanda Plass was only 20 years old when her life was taken from her on August 26, 2011. Amanda grew up in Chicopee, Massachusetts. She was described as being a very positive, bubbly, down-to-earth, free-spirited, and beautiful young woman. She absolutely loved sunflowers and was really artistic and talented. She loved jewelry, so she would make these really beautiful earrings with all sorts of different colored feathers. She was a bit of a hippie and a flower child, and she absolutely loved attending music festivals, especially folk and bluegrass music festivals. Amanda attended Chicopee Comprehensive High School. She actually did drop out of high school, but she did earn her equivalency degree. She had worked either as a waitress or a hostess at several different restaurants, and most recently, before her death, she worked at Friendly's on Memorial Drive in Chicopee. And she absolutely loved her job. She was very social and she loved talking to people, so being a waitress is a job that suited her very well. One of her regulars, named Marlene, said that she would go to Friendly's three to four times a week and said that Amanda was always so kind and energetic and said that her, along with so many other patrons of the restaurant, would request to be seated in her section because that's just how loved she was by everybody who had the pleasure of being served by her. Not only that, but she was the aunt to an adorable little three-year-old nephew who she absolutely loved. Her sister Emily's boyfriend said that she was so good with their little boy and he was always so happy to be around her and she was so happy to be around him. Amanda was so absolutely loved by everyone around her, especially her family, and they were absolutely devastated when she was just ripped away from them. Now, at the time of Amanda's death, she had just recently started dating a 27-year-old man named Seth Green. The two had only been dating for about a week or so, but he had been staying at her apartment almost every night the entire week. The two had very often smoked pot together, and the night of August 25th, 2011 was no different. According to Seth, the two had a very quiet night together that night. He spent the night at her place that night, just as he had the past week, then got up the next morning and went to his job as a construction worker. Later that day, August 26th, Seth had called Amanda to tell her that he was going to be back late and was not going to have time to drive her and pick her up for her shift at Friendly's. That was for 5 p.m. that evening. Now, I don't know if this was their normal arrangement, if he had always taken her to work, um, or if this was just something that they had agreed upon for that day in particular. Um, but either way, Amanda had also been in contact with her friend Mercedes. So they had been texting back and forth pretty much all day until around 4.20 p.m. when Amanda asked her if she could give her a ride to work, to which Mercedes agreed. Just before 5, Mercedes called Amanda saying that she was going to be picking her up for work, but Amanda did not answer her calls or her texts. She arrived at Amanda's apartment and just waited outside for about five minutes before just leaving. She didn't think much of this because she just assumed that maybe Amanda had just gotten a ride from someone else. But after still not hearing from her all day, Mercedes texted her again asking her if she was mad at her for being late to pick her up for work. But she never got a response. So after getting off of work, Seth actually drove over to Friendly's to pay Amanda a visit, but she actually was not there. He went over to his grandmother's house and then headed over to Amanda's apartment. He noticed that the window on the porch to the building was broken, which was pretty strange, but he didn't think too much of it at first. But he went up to the third floor to Amanda's unit anyways. When he got to her unit, I don't know if the door was unlocked or if he had to kick it open or anything like that, but to me, it sounded like it was unlocked. But what Seth walked into was a sight straight out of a nightmare. So immediately when Seth walked into Amanda's apartment, he did see some red in the kitchen. 
Now, at first, he wasn't totally horrified or panicked or anything because he actually initially thought that this was just red paint since Amanda had been painting that entire day. However, he then saw Amanda just laying there in the kitchen covered in blood. And this is when he realized that this wasn't just paint. He went into an immediate frenzy and immediately started CPR, but it was too late. No matter what he did, she just was not moving and he realized that it was of no use. So it was at this point that he decided to call 911. When police arrived, Seth was very visibly shaken and very, very frantic and upset. When police got inside to see what was going on, what they walked into was a horrific scene. There was blood all over the apartment and Amanda herself was absolutely covered in blood and laying in a pool of blood. She was wearing just a bra and her long pants. She had been stabbed six times, including in the chest, throat, and abdomen. There were very clear signs of a violent struggle. Police had also noted that there were bloody footprints next to Amanda's body that were consistent with women's Nike Air Max shoes with a non-marking sole size nine and a half. Police used this to say that it was possible that these could have been men's Air Max shoes size seven and a half using the general rule of thumb that you can just add two sizes and make it into a woman's size and then vice versa. Police took several samples off of Amanda's body, including skin cells, sweat, and scraped under her fingernails for DNA. Now, when talking to police, Seth did mention that the marijuana that they had left on the coffee table the night before was gone, and there was also a knife that was missing as well. At this point, they believed that Amanda must have been attacked while she was getting ready for work. Now, before we get more into how this case was investigated, something else happened at the crime scene that was absolutely inappropriate and uncalled for. We will get a little bit more into it later, but for the sake of keeping this in chronological order, I will mention this part now. So at the crime scene, a senior officer that was assigned to supervise and protect the integrity of the crime scene, Sergeant Keith LeMay decided that it would be a good idea to take pictures of Amanda's body lying on the floor covered in blood on his personal cell phone. He showed the photos to Sergeant Jeffrey Gaudier, who I couldn't find a picture of, apparently explaining the importance to him of not contaminating a crime scene. Then he sent these pictures to Jeffrey after Jeffrey had asked him to. Jeffrey then forwarded these pictures to patrolman Chad Levisque. So then Chad decided it was appropriate to then show these pictures of Amanda's dead body to several other people, including several football coaches at a youth football game the day after the murder took place. He had showed these pictures to people, apparently saying, this is the stuff that I have to deal with at work. Then another officer at the scene, patrolman Terry J. Deck, who was just there to log the people coming in and going out of Amanda's apartment for the state police, also took a picture of Amanda's dead body and then went ahead and individually emailed these photos to six Chicopee police officers. All six of these police officers went ahead and deleted the emails right away because they knew that it was inappropriate for these pictures to be in their email. But as far as I know, they did not report him. This situation was not discovered until two months later when the district attorney learned of the photo sharing. The district attorney then expressed his concerns to the mayor at the time, Michael Bissonette. Police Chief William Jeb started an investigation into the incident for the following four months after that. At the end of this, they were given very light punishments. All four officers were cited for incompetence and failure to conform to work standards. Deck and LeMay, who took the pictures, were required to work three unpaid shifts and were sent letters of reprimand. People were upset that the mayor, Michael Bassinet, did not handle the situation very seriously. Now, taking these sorts of pictures at crime scenes and sharing them apparently is not against the law, which is just so surprising and disturbing to me, but it's obviously still so inappropriate, so disrespectful, so disturbing, and if nothing else, these police should be fired for it, but they just seem to get very, very light punishments. But now let's fast forward a little bit. 
by 2018, a new mayor named Richard Koss was elected and he was very disturbed with how the situation was handled. There was an unrelated investigation into the behaviors of other officers that I won't get into because it's not, you know, important to this case, but that sparked them to look more into Jeffrey Gaudier again and he was actually fired. The reasoning for this was because during the initial investigation about these pictures, Gaudier had not been honest about his involvement in sharing the pictures and they questioned his credibility and reliability. Gaudier basically told them that he didn't know who sent him the picture and then he couldn't remember who he then sent the picture to. So obviously they did not believe him and assumed that he was just lying to avoid getting another officer in trouble. But then at the end of all of this, he appealed and he actually won the appeal and he got his job back. Now this whole scandal didn't, I guess, take over the entire investigation, but Amanda's family was still very bothered and disturbed by this, rightfully so, and this entire thing kind of took the attention completely away from Amanda's case and it acted as a distractor and it led them off of the path of just being concentrated on who killed Amanda. If you are to search Amanda Plass in Google, you will get mostly articles about the police officers and the scandal rather than pretty much anything about Amanda or who she was or the investigation or anything along those lines. I had to do a lot more digging to find out exactly what happened to Amanda and what kind of person she was and things like that than I did to find out about the actions of these disrespectful, careless men who decided to take pictures of Amanda's body after she had been brutally murdered. It just really bothers me when things like this distract from what's really important, which is this young woman who lost her life. and it's just so annoying to me that people will go and Google her and all you see, Jeffrey Gaudier, you know, the Chad guy, and just everyone who was involved in this instead of articles about Amanda. So now let's go back into the details surrounding Amanda's murder. So for quite a while after the murder, they were following a ton of different leads and the family was getting understandably frustrated with the investigation because it was taking a while. However, there was one lead that police had been following for quite some time that proved to be very substantial in this case. So just after the murder, Seth, Amanda's boyfriend, had told the state and Chicopee police that Amanda's apartment had actually been broken into several times in the past and Amanda thought that she knew who it was. So in one interview with investigators, Seth said that Amanda thought that the man who was breaking into her house was a short Puerto Rican man who lived a walk's distance down the street and whose name started with a D. He also said that she would see him around the neighborhood and she recognized him. He then said that in August of 2011, just a few days after this man had broken in, Seth stayed at her apartment. So I'm not sure if maybe he was staying at her apartment because she felt unsafe because this guy kept breaking in, or if this was just the timing and how things happened out that he just started staying at her apartment because they were dating. But either way, when he was staying at her apartment, he actually learned that Amanda and this Puerto Rican man had actually hung out before and she had his phone number. So she called him to make a meeting with him so that he could come over and they could talk about the break-in. So this man came over about 15 to 20 minutes after she had called. This was sometime in the morning and Amanda and Seth had been waiting for them to show up on the back porch. Seth gave police the following description of this man. He was Spanish, probably 21 to 23 years old. He had short hair, he had trimmed facial hair, and he was thin. He said that he spoke pretty good English and that when he was there, he was with his wife or girlfriend and a child who was around three or four years old. He described the woman as also being Spanish and more heavyset than him. So of course, when these people came over to their apartment, 
Amanda brought up the break-in and of course he told Amanda that it was not him. But she told him that a neighbor on the third floor saw him and was waiting for him when he came a different time. So it sounded like maybe this neighbor knew about the break-ins and he was maybe keeping a watch for him. Maybe Amanda had told this neighbor, you know, this guy keeps breaking in or asked him, hey, is your apartment getting broken into? Um, so this neighbor either wanted to figure out who it was for Amanda or he was just watching to see if anyone was gonna break into his apartment. But either way, she told him that this other neighbor had seen him going in and so she knew it was him, but he was very upset that she was just calling him out without actually asking him if he did it. Apparently, he had stolen a bowl that you use to smoke weed and she pretty much just said, hey, if you stole this, I want it back. She wasn't threatening to call the cops. She wasn't threatening, you know, to hurt him or his family or anything like that. She literally just said, hey, if you have my bowl, please give it back to me. So at this point, Seth had mentioned that there was a whiteboard in the apartment with his phone number written on it. So police went to check this out. And sure enough, there was a phone number on the whiteboard with the message. Dennis was here 8 11, 11 So police went and tried to figure out who this small Hispanic man could have been, but it took them quite some time to do so. So by 2013, two years later, they identified two men that could have fit the description. One was a man who lived in the area and had an extensive board of probation record, which included several violent crimes. However, this man was white, and even though he also had a heavier set girlfriend, she was also white. So that didn't completely match the description. They also were able to figure out this man's cell phone number, so they compared it to Amanda's cell phone, but they didn't find a match. The second man that they found was a man named Denna Rosa Roman. He had lived only four blocks away from Amanda's apartment, and he too had a heavier set Hispanic girlfriend, as well as a four-year-old son at the time. They were also able to get a hold of this man's phone number, and lo and behold, it was actually a match to Amanda's cell phone records. The cell phone records showed a total of nine calls between their two phones. Four of these calls were made from Amanda's phone to Dennis's phone, while five of them were from his phone to her phone. The calls lasted anywhere from a few seconds to 89 seconds, and all nine calls took place on July 28, 2011, with the last calls being from Dennis's phone at 11.26 a.m. The problem with this, though, was that Seth was actually shown a photo lineup of a bunch of different men, one of these photos being of Dennis, but he said that he didn't recognize any of them. But either way, police still wanted to talk to Denna Rosa Roman. So on October 29th, 2013, police were able to track down Dennis when he was in an area in Westerfield. So they tried to do that whole casual walk and talk thing where, you know, they walked up to him and said, you know, you don't have to talk to us, but obviously he kind of did. So one officer walked with him with two other cops following a few feet behind. This officer asked Dennis if he could go down to the station to talk, but Dennis declined. He then lit himself a cigarette and according to these police officers, he appeared to get very nervous. Dennis asked them what this was all about and told them that he would meet with them in a few days if he knew what this was all about. So they asked him if he knew a girl from Chicopee named Amanda. He said that he knew a lot of girls from Chicopee and that a couple of them were named Amanda. He then asked, did something happen to this girl because I don't ever go to Chicopee anymore. The officer said that it was the Amanda with tattoos on her chest and he did admit that he knew her. When he was asked when the last time that he was in Chicopee was, he said it had been a very long time, probably a couple of years. At this point, he asked the officer for his phone number and said that he could talk later because he was busy and had to go. At this point, I guess they were standing in front of his apartment because a woman with a child walked out and he said this was his girlfriend and his kid. He then threw his cigarette on the ground and walked off with these two individuals. So then by November 1st, 2013, 
the same officer received a phone call from someone saying it was Dennis, saying that he needed to talk to an officer as soon as he possibly could because he had something to tell them about Amanda from Chicopee, something that had been bothering him for two years, so they went to the Westfield Police Station to talk. This officer and a couple of other officers started heading that way, and as they were driving, Dennis had called them again and told them that he was waiting outside of the police station and said that he is starting to get very nervous. Once the police officers arrived at the police station, Dennis participated in a recorded interview and provided a DNA sample. Something else that was interesting that police noted in this interview is that Dennis was actually wearing Nike Air Max shoes, but this time with a different tread pattern than the ones that were at the crime scene two years earlier. So after this, a lot of the meat of the actual interview was redacted from the version made available to the public. But as we found out later, Dennis basically said that he actually was a witness to Amanda's murder. He said that he saw the man who killed her, but is afraid of revealing this man's identity because he's scared that this person will come back and kill him if he tells anyone. However, after this initial interview, his story had changed several times over the years, and there was pretty much nothing that was consistent about it. And it definitely does not fit the evidence that investigators had uncovered. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, police had collected DNA evidence from underneath Amanda's fingernails. They went ahead and tested that DNA against 20 different samples from 20 different men, including Dennis's DNA sample. And as you probably could have guessed by now, the DNA under Amanda's fingernails was very similar to Dennis's DNA profile. Now, when all of this was brought forward to Dennis, he claimed that he had a younger brother who this DNA probably belonged to and that it wasn't him. So he's just throwing his little brother under the bus for being involved with a murder. But obviously there was nothing pointing to this random younger brother. So on November 5th, Dennis was placed under arrest. Police came to the conclusion that contrary to Dennis's claim that he had not touched Amanda on the day that she died, the DNA proved that he did in fact come into contact with Amanda on August 26, 2011. So the trial for Amanda's murder started on July 7th, 2016 for first degree murder, which carries the mandatory sentence of life in prison without the possibility of parole. Of course, Dennis pled not guilty. The prosecuting attorney was assistant district attorney Karen Bell, and she argued that Dennis Rosa Roman had killed Amanda as a part of an armed robbery attempt to get her marijuana, her cell phone, as well as Seth's knife, which we know was missing from the table when police initially arrived. So the prosecution discussed the fact that Dennis actually had quite the record, including a history of domestic abuse and battery charges against his fiance at the time, burglary and distribution of drugs. They discussed the shoe prints that were found at the scene, which matched his size seven youth sneaker. Dennis had changed his story four times throughout the retelling of his story to police police, where he initially admitted that he was there for Amanda's murder, but said that he didn't actually do it and he was scared to give away the name of who actually did do it. Obviously, they brought up the DNA match and they had mentioned that Dennis's palm print was found on the broken porch window at the apartment building. Dennis's defense lawyer was Donald Frank. He admitted that Dennis was at Amanda's murder again, but said that he was not the one responsible. He said, like I mentioned earlier, that he witnessed the murder, but he was too afraid to give away the identity of the real killer because he feared for his and his family's safety. He also said that police kind of botched this investigation and failed to look into other suspects, which I kind of agree. They did a pretty terrible job in this investigation. I mean, it somehow took them two entire years to figure out that, you know, this man who was right in front of them matching their exact description with a lengthy criminal record 
with his literal phone number on Amanda's whiteboard after saying that he had broken in could have been responsible. It, it took them two years to figure this out. They were probably so focused on these pictures of Amanda's dead body that were floating around that they forgot that they were doing an actual investigation into a real murder. I truly believe that if Dennis didn't willingly give up his DNA and if they hadn't called police to say that he knew what happened to Amanda, that it would have taken a hell of a lot longer to pin this entire thing down. Dennis literally handed them the investigation on a silver platter. But either way, the jurors went into deliberation with over 160 pieces of evidence to discuss. After eight days of testimony at trial and five hours of jury deliberation, the jury came out with a verdict which found Denna Rosa Roman guilty of first-degree murder for the stabbing death of Amanda Plass on August 26, 2011, and was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. So that is where the case is at today. Now, in my opinion, this case took way too long for an investigation where the victim literally told them who it was and what happened. I don't know exactly what took them so long. I don't know if it was actually because of the pictures that were circulating. That's just my speculation. There were a lot of other things that seemed to have sidetracked them, so I really don't know why it took them so long to figure this entire thing out, but I am glad that there was at least some justice for this beautiful young woman. She did not deserve what happened to her whatsoever. I have no idea how stealing someone's weed, which I imagine probably wasn't even worth that much, turned into her being murdered in the most brutal way possible. Amanda's family had to fight so hard to make people listen to actually solved their daughter's murder, but unfortunately, all of this other nonsense got in the way. And I know that they are at least trying to get a law in place which does make it illegal to take pictures of a victim's body at the crime scene, which should have been illegal in the first place, but at least they are trying to fight for other victims who might fall to, you know, these inappropriate behaviors of the people that are supposed to be protecting and, you know, serving and protecting the integrity of the crime scene. These people took advantage of their position to take photos of a woman's body after she had just been brutally murdered and was in the most vulnerable state that a human can ever even be in, and then showed them to whoever wanted to see them. Then on top of that, we find out that this man killed her for literally no reason at all. I am struggling to figure out how this was all worth this. How someone can lose their life because some random dude stole something of such little value after she was being so nice to him and literally just saying, hey, if you took my bowl, just give it back. It's just, I cannot understand what goes through people's heads like this. It's not like these were drugs that were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, like, you know, 50, 100 pounds of weed. It's not like these were drugs that were hard to come by and were worth a lot of money. It was just off of marijuana and a bowl that someone's life was ended. It's just unbelievable and somehow he still refuses to take responsibility for what he did. He won't admit that he killed her and somehow thinks that people are just going to believe him. I don't even know. I don't know why you wouldn't admit to it. It's, it's, doesn't even make sense to me. None of this makes sense to me. At the end of the day, a beautiful young woman who had so much life ahead of her lost her life for literally zero reason at all. And that is just so absolutely heartbreaking and my heart goes out to her and her family and everyone who was affected by this. So that is where I am going to end today's video. Thank you so much for listening to Amanda's story. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Also, if you are interested in 33% off of Native Deodorant, make sure to check the link down below and use code Rachel Shannon to get three bars of deodorant for only $24 plus free shipping. Don't forget to head over to my Twitter and Instagram and go ahead and give those a follow. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, 
please feel free to email them to me at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.